So we're back uh, with Iris Lace, the Irma Project, and the Progression Center. Ultimate goal is to prove the fact that if you take um, the sum over the primes, which are congruent to modulus A mod M, and always A is prime to M, that that diverges as S goes to 1. And in fact, it diverges at the same rate as 1 over the number of classes mod M, P of M, which are invertible by the log over S minus 1. That's S goes to 1. So the fact that it diverges certainly implies that the number of primes congruent to A mod M is infinite, but it also shows that they they're about one over P of M of those primes. So they're well distributed. Yeah, that's yeah, this many classes. And the primes fall out equally into each class because we sum over all primes, you get the log of one over S minus one. So that's our that's pure choice proof. And we have to set up a little bit. And the, the brilliant idea he had was to apply the ideas of Fourier analysis, which had just begun. Uh, to enter mathematics, so he seriously proved a lot of theorems about Fourier series and whatnot, but he applied them to the finite group that Gauss had studied, which was the, the multiplicative group of mod M. And you can apply Fourier analysis to them. And I'll show you how that goes. It's a wonderful combination of this kind of analysis with, with algebra. So he studied the, the Fourier analysis concerns the characters of um, abelian groups. And people, as I've said, have done the additive group of real numbers, but this is the first time someone did it for a finite group. And, and the last time we defined g hat for a finite group, so let's, this is the finite group we're going to use, but what I'll say now just pertains to any finite abelian group, g hat was the set of all homomorphisms, chi from c to c star, the catastic. Now that's the structure of a group. If you have two characters, you get another one by defining the, the product character on G is just chi of G plus chi prime of G. So you use, you use the multiplication on C star to get a product on the set of characters, and that's another abelian group. And the last time we showed, <coughs> we, we, we got an inductive argument. We showed that you had a subgroup of G and you had a character of H. And it always extended to a character <coughs> of G, not uniquely, but it extended, which showed that the, the map restriction of characters from G hat to H hat was a subjective map restriction of chi to H. So a character of G clearly is one of a subgroup, and the <coughs> extension lemma shows that that a map is subjective, and <coughs> kernel is the character group is the characters which are trivial on, on uh, H, and any character which is trivial on H gives a character of G mod H, and conversely, any character of G mod H is a character of G trivial on H. So you get an exact sequence for the character group, and, and then arguing by induction, because it's true for cyclic groups, we showed that the uh, order of G hat is the same as the order of G as for G, G mod N. We saw the character group was canonically the nth roots of unity inside of C star because you can take a generator to any nth root of unity. And that also showed last time that we had a map from G to the double, the dual of its dual <coughs> group. So the elements of G could be viewed as characters of the character group that takes <coughs> to the character that takes chi to chi of G. So it's like double duality of vector spaces. And uh, it's clear that this is an injective map because uh, if, if, if you had anything in the kernel, that would be an element in G such that uh, this was the trivial character of the character group so that for all chi, chi of G was equal to one. So G is in the kernel. And for all chi, chi of G is equal to one. But um, that's true only for the identity element because uh, if I had a non-identity element, I would take the cyclic subgroup and generate it. I construct a non-trivial character in that cyclic subgroup, which is non-trivial on G, then I extend it to the group. So if I have a non-trivial element in the group, I can find the character, which is non-trivial on it. 
So that implies the kernel is just the identity. And since these two abelian groups have the same order, that implies that this map is an isomorphism. So G is canonically a double dual. In fact, it's isomorphic to its character group, but not canonically. OK, now since these two groups have the same order, the order of G is also the dimension of the, of the complex vector space of functions from G to C, <coughs> just arbitrary functions from G to C. And the characters are elements in that vector space. And each character is an element in B. It's a specific kind of function on, on the group. Namely, it, it's something which gives a multiplicative homomorphism. So the, the, the important theorem, which is the beginning of Fourier analysis, is that the characters give a basis of this space. The uh, characters of G give the basis. So that as functions, I mean, since they have the same number of characters as the, as the dimension of vector space, you can either prove they're linearly independent or they'll span. I'll show you that they span here. OK? All right, so an obvious basis for G is characteristic functions of an element. So uh, the root, an obvious basis. or B are the functions, maybe I'll call them F sub G, one for each element in the group, where F sub G of H is equal to one if H is equal to G, and zero if H is not equal to G. I mean, any function can be obviously written in terms of those <coughs> functions, right? I mean, you know, the function is just so, <laughs> okay, so if I can write these functions, these sort of characteristic functions in terms of characters, then I can write any function in terms of characters, and that proves that they span. Okay, so let's do that because it's instructive to see how it works. Let's start off with the function which is one on the identity. Let's do f of e. We need to get a better eraser. All right, f e is equal to 1 on the identity element that includes 0 on everything else. Okay. Well, I claim that Fe is the sum over all the characters chi of chi. So just the sum of the characters. That's, a, that's an element. So um, that would give the expression for at least one of these functions. All right. Now, why is that true? Well, let's, oh, sorry. Not, not correct. You have to divide by the order of the group. That's an important thing. This is why. 1 over the order of the group, the sum of chi, all chi. OK, so let's check this out. First of all, does it take the value 1 on the identity? Well, all characters vanish on the, uh, are 1 on the identity. So this sum is the order of the group. You divide by the order of the group, and you get 1. That's why we need to divide by the order of the group. OK? <coughs> so clear, clearly, equal 1 on. And dividing is no problem because we're in the complex numbers. If we were trying to do this over an arbitrary field and we were in characteristics, dividing the order of the group, things start to go wrong, terribly wrong. All right. <coughs> but what about if we try on another element in the group? So what about 1 over the order of g summation chi of chi of g for g not equal to the identity element? Well. <coughs> If you think about that sum, uh, we have to show that it's zero. So that doesn't make any difference about this. So we just need to show that when we sum a character, all the characters of the group over a non-trivial element, it's zero. Okay, why is that? Well, since this element is not the identity, we can find a chi prime, <coughs> which is not one on the element. Right, we've seen that before. Take the cyclic subgroup generated by the element, use the fact that there's a character of that cyclic subgroup that takes that element to a non-trivial n root unity and extend it to the entire group. So we find a character with the property that on this element, it's not one. All right, well then the sum over the 
the sum over the characters is, let's forget this for the moment, this sum, this sum is the same as the sum over um, the different characters of chi, chi prime of g. Right, I mean, if I just translate the characters by chi prime, I still get all the characters. Okay, and this is the same as chi prime of g times the sum over all characters chi of chi of g. All right, but this is this is not the identity. So the only time you can have a sum is not the identity times the same sum as if the sum is zero. So that implies sum over all chi of chi of g <coughs> to zero. And in fact, this function <coughs> has the right properties. It's one on the identity element, and it's one on zero on g, which are not equal to the identity. Now, because of this double duality business, um, anytime you prove a theorem about characters, you, you, you have a corresponding theorem where you reverse the orders of G and G prime. Because G is the character group of G hat. So what's the, what's the corresponding result of this sum over characters on the non-identity element is, is zero? Well, <clears throat> yeah, the, um, the, the analogous theorem in the, the dual theorem, dual formula, is this. If chi is not equal to the identity character, then the sum over all elements in the group of chi of g is equal to 0. See here, here we, here we took g not equal to the identity element, the sum over all chi is 0. Here we take chi, not the identity character. The sum over all elements in the group is zero. And um, it's the same proof. You choose the proof. You choose g prime such that um, chi, sorry, chi of g prime is not equal to one. And then the sum over g, chi of g, is equal to the same thing as the sum over g of chi of G, G prime. This also runs through the entire group now, right? And that's equal to chi of G prime, the sum over chi of G. And this is not equal to one, so this sum has to be zero. Okay? Now this is an important formula back in, so we still haven't finished proving this theorem, but I'm, I'm going to make an aside about this formula in the context of these Dirichlet L functions. So let me put that up here. Remember, we defined L chi s as the sum from n greater than or equal to 1, n prime to m. This is for a character of z my m z star. Z star of chi of n over n to the s. Now, if chi, if, the, if chi is the trivial character, this is a pretty simple multiple of the zeta function. So if chi is equal to 1, uh, L, chi, L chi s is the zeta function. <laughs> but you have to put p, of, p dividing m of or minus p to the minus s. You cancel out the order factor of the primes dividing n so that you only get the sum over integers which are relatively prime to n. And in particular, as, uh, as s tends to 1, this is a non-zero constant, and this guy has a pole, so this has a pole at s equal 1. Simple pole. The residue is different now because you have now this factor in it, but it still has a pole at s equal 1. But, in fact, when chi is not equal to 1, you can use this wonderful fact to show that the series defining L chi s converges in the real part of S 
greater than zero. In fact, converges it uniformly in compact subsets of that region. So it defines a holomorphic function for real part of s greater than zero, namely it's fine at s equal one. And the reason is that if you, <coughs> for, zeta, for the zeta function, if you take the sum of the coefficients, suppose you have some Dirichlet series a n over n to the s, and you take the sum of a n for n less than x, Right, suppose we do that for both series, the, the zeta function and L chi of s. For the zeta function, this sum is about x, right? Because these terms are all one. Well, not exactly. I mean, you have some things about relatively front end, but it's growing at the same size as x, right? But for, for the zeta function, but for this Dirichlet L function with a non-trivial character, this sum is bounded as x goes to infinity. The sum of the coefficients of the Dirichlet series. Well, what are the coefficients? The coefficients are this chi of n. Why is it bounded? Well, every time you run through an, a complete set of residue classes mod m, that's summing over the elements in this group z mod m star of the values of that character. And that's zero. So it, it, it can be non-zero as you get through the residue class, but it never gets bigger than the number of residue classes, right? So it's a completely different phenomenon. This is because as the sum over a full set of classes mod m of chi of n is equal to zero. So it's a group theoretic fact. And I won't prove this, but I will show that if you have a Dirichlet series, you can find a proof in Sayre's course of arithmetic. If you have a Dirichlet series where the sum, where the coefficients less than x remain bounded, then it converges in real part of s greater than zero. So it's a completely different analytic behavior than uh, the Zeta function. And that's what really is going on uh, in Dirichlet's when it defines a whole market function. A little bit of group theory. Okay, we're still not done with the proof of this because we've only shown that the function f of e has this right, can be written in sum of characters. So what about the function f sub g, the function which takes the value one on g and zero on elements not equal to g? That's f sub g. Well, I claim that's also a sum of characters. And you, did, you don't put in the coefficient one, you put in the coefficient chi bar of g times chi. So this is one if you had the trivial character. If you had, um, if, if g was the identity <coughs> element, sorry, then these would all be one, like we had before. But chi bar <coughs> is just the complex conjugate, and that's the same as chi inverse. Because remember, the values of chi take values on the unit circle. So when you conjugate them, they go to their inverse, roots of unity claim. All right, I claim this is true. Why? Well, if we evaluate on the element g, we get chi bar of g times chi of g. And, and since chi is absolute value one, all the terms are one. You sum over all chi, there are this many of them. Uh, and then you divide by this, so you get one. That worked, okay. But what about uh, h not equal to g? Well. Let's see what happens. Fg of h is 1 over the order of g. It's the sum of chi bar of g, chi of h, over all h. All chi, sorry. Over all chi. But this is the same as chi of h g inverse. Because remember, chi of chi of chi bar is chi inverse, and chi inverse of g is chi of g inverse by the homomorphism property. Okay, and since g is not equal to h, this is a non-identity element in g. And when you sum over a non-identity element over all characters, you get zero by the previous proof. Good? So that shows that all of these functions, I'll just keep this up here, can be written as linear combinations of the characters which shows that the linear combination of the characters span, because these functions certainly span, 
And because it has the same order as the dimension, they're zero faces. So therefore, this is the unique way to write f sub g as a sum of characters. Okay. Now, looking at this, we can see how we can write the general function as a sum of characters. Because we can write the general function out as a sum of these things, and then write the general, general f is the sum over g e of, of uh, f of g times f sub g, right? Did I do that right? Okay. And, uh, <coughs> and we have expressions now for f sub g, so it's the sum over g, uh, one over the order of the root g, the sum over chi of chi bar of g. Mm -hmm. times chi, except I forgot f somewhere. Yeah, this is like an f of g up here. Okay. This, is, this is the function f sub g. This is the value of m on g. So I, I get that expression. Then if I reverse the order, I get the Fourier transform. So um, define for every function of g, a function f hat on the character group. And the function f hat on the character group is gotten by summing over the group f hat of chi by definition 1 over, no, I just sum over the group, sorry. Sum over g f of g chi bar of g. So if I have a function on G that gives me a new function, okay, and so that's the Fourier transform of the function. It's now a function on characters by integrating over the group. And then you recover the original function, and that's the big theorem on Fourier inversion. And we'll go, we'll see what this looks like in the real case. Theorem. And that's what you get out of our little analysis here, is that f can recover from its Fourier transform using f is 1 over the order of g, the sum over chi, f hat of chi times chi. And that gives an expression for any function on the group as uniquely as a linear combination of characters, namely the coefficients are the Fourier transform divided by the order of the group. Okay? And I think if you just take this and rearrange things a little bit, you'll get that. Okay, now why is this similar to Fourier analysis? Well, Dirichlet and, and uh, Fourier and Riemann have studied functions on R mod Z. Functions, periodic functions on the real line, periodic, and the characters, characters of R mod Z, and they had written, they had defined the Fourier coefficients of F for N and Z to be the integral over um, R mod Z of uh, f of x e to the minus 2 pi i nx dx, where this is the measure that gives this uh, compact group volume 1. Okay, well, that's, that's essentially this. You see, um, the every integer gives a character chi n of r mod z to be e to the 2 pi i n x. That's a homomorphism from r mod z into the multiplicative group of complex numbers. And these are all the characters, characters of r mod z. In other words, the character group of r mod z in our sense is just the integers. 
And this would be the Fourier transform evaluated on a character, right? It's, this is like an integral over the group of the value of the function times the value of the character, complex conjugate, <coughs> dx. And then the, the inversion formula, the way you got this back, was that, that you find that, that f of x could sometimes, you know, in, in, good, in good analytic situations, could be written as the sum over n and z of a n of f e <coughs> by i and x. So that's, that's another integral, but now over the character group, right, it's sum over the character group of the Fourier transform of f, this Fourier coefficient, that's this Fourier transform evaluated on n times the value of character. Right? So this is the analysis that, that Fourier had done studying the heat equation in periodic situations and uh, Dirichlet like transformed into finite groups. Now you might wonder, well look, here's just, we're integrating over this group and we're somehow integrating over this group just by summing over this group. Um, and here it looks like we're integrating over the group. Why did we have to put in this one over the order of g? Well, it's because when you're working on um, a pair of groups where the character group is, is um, where the group is maybe compact, then the dual group is discrete. And the measures you're supposed to use for Fourier transform are supposed to have volume one on the compact group and the counting measure on the discrete group, right? Now a finite group is both compact and discrete. So if in one kind of Fourier transform you use the measure of volume one, which is this measure, right? This is the measure one over G, delta G or something, that's the measure, sum over delta G, that's the measure that has volume one on the group. Every element has, has measure one, right? So if you summed over a whole group, you get measure G and then you have to divide by that. And then on the other side, you have to use just counting measure on the group. Now, the people who do a lot of Fourier analysis on cyclic groups, and that's a very active, uh, you, you'd be surprised, but even for G is Z mod N Z, there's a huge amount of work on Fourier analysis on that finite abelian group. Terry Tao's work is all about Fourier analysis on that finite group. Uh, um, Tim Gowers' work is all about Fourier analysis on that finite group. And you'll see all kinds of things in their formulas that have one over the square root of n times such and such as this. And that's because they're trying to put the same measure on the group as they do for the Fourier transform. Whereas I've tried to put one, you know, you could go either way. You could define the Fourier transform by dividing by one over the order of g and then put one in here, or the other way. But you have to normalize the measures correctly to get Fourier inversion. Anyhow, Dirichlet knew all about this, and he had proved all kinds of theorems about when this theorem, when this actually converged, and things like that. And it, I mean, it's just beautiful theorems. It has to do with the, the, the rate of convergence of this series has to do with the differentiability of f. Who could have imagined that? Right? Okay. We'll leave that alone. Anyhow, we have these nice theorems for um, Fourier transform. Now, I go back to I go back to this. Let's take let's do a corollary of what we've done about. So we now go back to the finite group z mod n star. And we want to rewrite this series, n congruent to a mod m, n greater than or equal to 1, 1 over n to the s. This is going to be just preparatory. In terms of our Dirichlet L series, and that's this great idea, you see, that you can use the characters to write any function on the group. Well, this is, this is the, you can think about this as the function uh, f sub a of n over n to the s, right, for n greater than or equal to 1. Find to f, right? I mean, it's the function that just puts a 1 whenever <coughs> n is in this class, and it puts a 0 otherwise. And we've written this function in terms of characters, right? At least I hope we did. Right, so this, this function in terms of characters was 1 over phi of m, times the sum over all the characters of z mod m star 
by bar of A times chi. And we're evaluating it in, so it's chi of n. So this becomes 1 over u of phi of m, the sum over n greater or equal to 1 prime to n, the sum over the characters chi of z mod m star of <clears throat> chi bar of a, chi of n over n to the s. by our character theory. And now we reverse this order. This is a finite sum. This is an infinite sum, right? But if we pull out the chi bar of A, we get, um, yeah, one over phi of M, the sum over chi, chi bar of A, and then what we're left with is L of chi S, because we're left with the sum over all n of chi of n over n to the s, which is the Dirichlet L function. Okay, so we've rewritten this sum over n congruent to a mod m using Fourier analysis on this finite abelian group as a sum of these Dirichlet L functions, which have better behavior. For example, they're going to have an Euler product. And moreover, <coughs> we know something about the behavior of these functions as s tends to one. Namely, for the trivial character, this has a fold at s equal 1. And for all the other characters, it's regular at s equal 1. And when we know what the order of the pole is. It behaves like, like basically like this 1 over uh, <coughs> up, to, up to a constant. So uh, this, is, this behaves like 1 over phi of m, some constant over s minus 1. The constant has to do with those factors of primes dividing m uh, as s tends to 1, because all these other Dirichlet L series for the non trivial characters are regular, bounded as s tends to 1. So it blows up at this rate, just you know, as the zeta function blew up. Well, we know, it. I mean, this is going to be, a, this is going to have a pole at s equal 1, where there's something over larger and larger n. Okay. Now, what Dirichlet wants to do is the same for the primes. So that's all very well, but that was pretty obvious that this series was going to blow up. Again, it's the same phenomenon here. If you summed over the coefficients of the Dirichlet series, it would be like 1 over 5 m times x. Right? Because it's 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. OK. So I want to do the same. Give a similar argument. for the sum of 1 over p to the s, where p is congruent to a mod m. OK, if we can do that, uh, and we can get some idea of its growth as s tends to 1, well, let's rewrite this. <clears throat> Same pr principle of Fourier analysis. It's 1 over 5 m, the sum over all characters chi, chi bar of A. And then, instead of putting in L chi of S, we just have to sum over the primes, P, chi of P over P to the S. And that sum is over primes prime to M, as usual. OK, let's call this function <coughs> f sub chi of s. It converges for real, s part, real part of s greater than 1. No problem. OK, and uh, we know that for the trivial character, where chi is equal to 1, uh, the sum of 1 over p of the s is like the log of 1 over s minus 1 as s goes to 1. We got that out of the Euler product and some estimates uh, for the zeta function. OK. Now suppose uh, we can show that 
This remains bounded if f chi of s remains bounded as s goes to 1, or chi not equal to 1, then we have the result we want. Because uh, when chi is equal to 1, so this is 1, we get this behavior. And then for chi not equal to 1, we get something which doesn't go to infinity. And so the asymptotic behavior of this is 1 over e of m times this. Okay? So that's what we did over here, but that was easy because here we had the whole L function. And the whole L function, which we could show by very simple arguments on Dirichlet series, actually converged at s equal 1. Whereas here, we just have, we just have the prime. Okay, well I claim, I claim, got this, for, always for now we're doing chi not equal to 1. F chi of s remains bounded as s goes to 1, if and only if L chi of 1 is not equal to 0. So it becomes a, a, a statement about the L function at s equal 1. Why? Well, because chi is a character, this, this L chi of s, which is given by definition as the sum, chi of n over n to the s, it behaves, that, since this is multiplicative as a function, this is the same as the product over all prime phi of 1 minus chi of phi over phi to the s inverse. Inverse. Because if you if you blow this out using the geometric series, you get one plus chi of p to the minus s plus pi, chi of p squared p to the minus two s, but chi of p squared is chi of p squared, and you get that. Well, this is this is one plus chi of p over p to the s plus chi of p squared over p to the two s plus. So that gives you all those factors, and then by the unicity of prime factorization, uh, when you put the, when you take that product, you get exactly this because chi of chi of p to the a to the b is chi of p to the a times chi of p to the b. So the, the, the fact that we are dealing with a character gives us an Euler product for this series, whereas for this series, there's no Euler product. This is just combination of series that have Euler products, but it, in fact, has none. Okay, so what's good about that? Well, let's take the log of this. Again, this is all for real part of S greater than 1, where everything is convergent. And we do this exactly the way Euler did. That's the sum over the primes P of the log of, well, minus the log of 1 minus chi of P <coughs> minus S. And then we use the power series for the logarithm. This, this number is less than 1, so it converges. And not take less than 1 in absolute value. That converges in this region. And we write it as <coughs> sum over p and k of um, chi of uh, k over to the minus ks divided by k. It's actually yeah, chi of p, well, it could be chi of p and k. So that's the power series for log, where we sum over all primes, and then we take the power series a minus the log of 1 minus x is x minus x squared plus, sorry, plus x squared over 2 plus x squared over 3, etc. Okay? So we're using that power series. Now we do what Euler did. We separate out the terms where k is equal to 1 and everything else. So this is equal to the sum where k is equal to 1. It's chi of p over p to the s all over p plus the sum over p where k is at least 2. Okay, This is our function f chi of s. Right, that we're trying to prove something about. 
but then we were trying to prove it remains bounded as s goes to one. This is a series where we can, this is absolutely convergent to a number we showed in Euler's proof less than or equal to one. So this is certainly bounded as s goes to one, okay? Now, therefore, the behavior is this, of this as s goes to one has to do with the behavior of this series as s goes to one. Now, we know it doesn't blow up. It, it's, it's, it's regular at f equal one, but that doesn't mean the log is regular because this should be coming smaller and smaller and smaller, and the log could go to negative infinity. And so what we have to do is show that this number is non-zero. Then we can take its log, it's bounded, and that would give the boundedness of this as s goes to one. Okay, so it's trickier than just, I mean, it, there are really two brilliant steps in Dirichlet's proof. The first is rewriting a series like this, or even better, a series like this, using Fourier analysis on the finite proof. And the second is realizing that to deal with these terms for non-trivial characters, you have to prove that this Dirichlet L function at one, which is defined by a convergent series, not absolutely convergent, but convergent series, is non-zero. And we're going to see there are a lot of results, you know, such and such as non-zero, which are important in analytic number theory. Okay, so how did Dirichlet prove that this L function at one was non-zero? Well, first I'll show you how the way it's proved in the books, but Dirichlet didn't have that. So in the books, for example, there's a very nice treatment of it uh, in uh, Sierra's book, of course, in arithmetic. What you do is you consider the product over all chi of C mod M star of L chi X. Okay. Um, let's call that product very suggestively zeta M of S, because it only now depends on the integer M. Now that's regular for S bigger than one. And if you could show that this function had a simple pole at S equal one, then since this is equal to the zeta function of S with some mod minor modifications times the product for chi not equal to one of L chi S, if this has a, a simple pole at s equal one, that means that since this has a simple pole, and the orders of holomorphic functions sort of add, these cannot be zero. Okay, so his proof really rearranges things and takes this whole product, doesn't try to prove that any one of them is non zero at s equal one, but takes the product of all of them, rearranges things, and gets a, a, a much simpler series. So I'll show you how that goes. But that I want to emphasize is not the way that Dirichlet did this. Um, so why is this a simpler thing to consider? Well, like this product is the same as using the Euler product for each one of these series. It's the product of P, not dividing M, and then the product over chi of d mod M star. <coughs> of one minus chi of p, p to the minus s inverse. So we're gonna, we're gonna try to figure out a simpler expression for this product. So here's a lemma. Forget about p to the minus s. If I have a product over all chi of z mod m star, and I write one minus chi of um, p t for a variable t. That's equal to one minus t to the f p of m over f, where f is the order of the prime p in z mod m star. 
So in particular, f divides phi of m because it generates a subgroup of that group. So that this becomes a much simpler expression. This just, if, if you believe the lemma, which I'll prove for you, this is the product now over all p not dividing m of uh, 1 minus chi of p. So no, sorry, you, know, forget, you can forget about chi. 1 minus p to the minus fs to um, the minus p of m over f. And when you blow that out, you can again blow this out into a Dirichlet series, a n n to the minus s. You find that it's a Dirichlet series where all the coefficients are greater than or equal to zero. They're real numbers. Greater than or equal to zero. Well, again, you, you write this out in a geometric series. All the coefficients are, are one. Then you take it to this power, et cetera. And for these Dirichlet series where all the coefficients are greater than or equal to zero, you start expecting that you might have a pole that has equal one because when you sum up all the coefficients for n less than x, there's no cancellation at all, like there is for L chi s. So, and then one shows that this has a simple pole that has equal one. Okay, let's prove the lemma so that we see that by taking the product over all the characters chi, we get a simpler series. And then I'll tell you really what that series is. Okay, um, so here's the proof. Uh, let, let w equal an f root of one. You see star. Well, then there are characters <coughs> then we, have, we can make characters chi of z mod m star with chi of p equal to w. Because we, we know that it generates a cyclic subgroup of order f. And uh, for, it's a generator. So we can take it to any f root of 1 in z star. How many such characters can we make? Well, the number, you know, when you do a restriction of characters, it's unique up to a character in the quotient group. So you get this many characters with, so you get that phi of m over f such chi. And there are <coughs> f choices for w. So when you take this product, you're taking a product over the w, which are in f roots of unity of um, 1 minus w of t and uh, to the phi of f, phi of m over f power. I mean, that's what this product would be. I mean, chi of phi is an f root of unity. And this product, before you take it to any powers, is the same as 1 minus t to the f because the different roots of this polynomial are in the f roots of unity. So that's the proof. And so you get a much simpler series when you take the product and you can prove that that has a simple pole that has equal one. Now, what is that? Um, so what Dirichlet didn't know, but he, he certainly uh, got close, is that this function, the product over all chi, is equal to what we call the zeta function of the cyclotomic field. And we're going to get there, where you adjoin the mth root of unity to the rational number. And the reason Dirichlet didn't know about this was there was no theory of cyclotomic fields or their data functions or anything like that. Gauss had done a lot of work on cyclotomy, but no one had really studied these as field extensions of the rational numbers. And until there was a huge amount of work in the next, well, in contemporary years, like really, Kummer did a great deal of work on these fields. And by the time he had defined the zeta functions, and Dirk Dedekind also defined the zeta functions of these fields, they realized that they were given very simply as this product. 
And it turns out that the zeta function of any number field has a simple fold on s equal one, as we're going to see. So that somehow explains what's going on on this proof. But, but as I said, Dirichlet did not have uh, cyclotomic fields or their zeta function to fool around with. So what did he do? So this proof is actually much more interesting. Um, what he did was he, he, he again is trying to prove that these, so he's, So once you, once you get, by the way, uh, a simple pole for this function, that says that for chi not equal to one, these functions are regular at s equal one, and then that proves uh, the theorem about primes and arithmetic progressions. But Dirichlet did this with his bare hands. He, to show Dirichlet shows L chi one, is not equal to zero for chi not equal to one in two steps. The first step is he considers the characters that are not equal to their complex conjugates. So complex conjugation gives an involution of the set of characters in C mod n, right? Take character two is inverse. So remember the complex conjugate is the inverse. So that means that the, char that the character is not quadratic. Okay. Well, then you see, then L of chi bar s is is uh, well, it's the sum of chi bar of n over n to the s. But complex conjugation is a continuous automorphism of the complex numbers, so it commutes with convergence. So this is the same as the sum of chi of n over n to the s bar. I mean, n to the n, or at least on the real numbers. I mean, you have to do some, okay, for s real, which is the only case Dirichlet cared about, which is the complex conjugate of L chi of s. And therefore, if this vanished at s equal one, so would this vanish at s equal one, okay? And that would mean that in this product, there was a double zero at s equal one which when you multiply by the pole of the zeta function would mean that this product had to vanish at s equal one. And since this is a Dirichlet, whatever Dirichlet knew, he knew it was a Dirichlet series of positive coefficients and things like that. So it certainly didn't vanish at s equal one. And that's, that's ludicrous. If you have a series summation a n over n to the s where uh, a n is greater than or equal to zero and a lot of them are, are positive, this does not vanish as you go to s equal one. So that was impossible. So a single zero produces two, and then zeta m of one is equal to zero, and he knew that was ridiculous. Okay, so then he's left with the case where chi squared is equal to one. In that case, the series is fixed by complex conjugation. Then, then it's just, you know, then, then you have, you know, a summation which looks like, you know, plus or minus one over n to the s, n greater than equal to one, where this, so that was like, uh, that was like the case we did for z mod four star, where you had the series one minus one over three to the s plus one over five to the s. In case the coefficients are all plus or minus one. Okay. And then he made a very deep analysis and showed that this was related to quadratic fields. L chi one is related to the arithmetic, and this is much deeper than anything else, of this Q, this field, which was either the square root of plus or minus m, we'll see which one. And, uh, and this relation, shows that L chi one cannot be equal to zero. In fact, he gives an actual formula for L chi one where all the terms in it are non-zero, and so that's the, that's the proof. So this relationship with the arithmetic of quadratic fields is extremely deep, and uh, it's, it's a precursor to the fact that the product 
over all the various chi gives you the zeta function of the cyclotomic field. In fact, what Dirichlet proved was that if you took zeta function of s and you multiplied it by this L chi s, where chi squared is equal to 1, that was equal to the zeta function of this quadratic extension. He didn't have a definition of this, but he knew what it was because he had the theory of binary quadratic forms and Gauss had developed that to an, an enormous extent and that allowed him to define what we would now call ideals in this quadratic field, et cetera, et cetera. And he could relate the product of these two functions to the sum over of various binary theta series and just be All right, so I'm gonna show you that. But I think uh, I'm gonna do, uh, I think I'm gonna do zeta functions of number fields first, and then we'll come back to this zeta functions of quadratic fields. And this equality was exactly quadratic reciprocity. And we'll see how wonderful that is. So it's Dirichlet's analytic interpretation of quadratic reciprocity, and, and uh, from that non-vanishing we get um, this theorem of prime analytic progression. So he did it all at once. Um, let me just give you an idea of how uh, subtle this thing is and how little we know. All right, so take a case where chi squared is 1. So this function is, is real on the real axis. And, uh, and we know it converges. So uh, consider L chi s in the, on the line on the interval between 0 and 1. OK? It's convergent, so it makes perfect sense. We know at 1, it's non-zero. Okay. We suspect that it's non-vanishing on this entire interval. If one could prove, so are there zeros close to 1? Those have a special name because they were studied by Ziegel. They're called Ziegel zeros. If there's zeros that are close to one, it means that in this exact formula that Dirichlet found for this value, the terms on the right-hand side are small because it's a continuous function. So even though we don't know this is, we know this is non-zero. We don't know we don't know how to bound it away from zero. In other words, as far as we know, there could be zeros of these functions that are arbitrary close to one. We believe that there should no be no conjecture L chi s not equal to zero on this interval. <coughs> but no one can prove that. That would be a tremendous advance in analytic number theory. So far, I think, you know, I, I don't even know how far that people could get to the left of one, but it's, it's a it's a, it's a huge question. So the, the question is about a real S or? Just real S, S. on the interval, on the real interval, where the function takes real values, it converges, or it's a problem in real analysis. Are there zeros close to one? And people think not, but okay. So other non-vanishing results of the style of Dirichlet's result, uh, which people should know about, we're not gonna cover here, is um, first of all, we know that zeta of s is not equal to zero for the real part of s equal to one, but s not equal to one. So if you look in the complex plane, here's s equal to one, where the zeta function has a pole. Here's a line where the real part is one, and we know that the zeta function doesn't vanish on that line. That's the problem. <coughs> That's equivalent to um, the fact that the number of primes less than x is like x over log x, the prime number theorem. If one wants to improve the prime number theorem, one wants to show that in fact there are no zeros until you get to the line where real part of s is equal to a half. There are, there are an infinite number of zeros on that line, but one would like to push this further in, if you could, um, that's, that's the Riemann hypothesis, that there are no zeros here. But even if you could construct what's called the zero-free region, and the best zero-free regions so far look like something like this. You know, they just tail off closer and closer and closer to one as you get 
larger and larger imaginary parts. So the big problem in analytic number theory is to take this result and prove that zeta s is not equal to zero for real part of s greater than half. And that would improve the prime number theorem a lot. Uh, it would say basically that it, it, it's asymptotic to this, and the error term is uh, O of x to the 1 half plus, say, plus epsilon for any epsilon. So the error term is of the order of square root of x, maybe square root of x over log x. Uh, and the further you can move it closer to this, the, the, the better estimates you get. But it, it also has structural relevance beyond just estimating primes. I mean, if, if it were wrong, it would be extremely bizarre. Okay, so that's all I'm going to do on Dirac's place theorem, but we're going to swing back once we have defined the zeta function of a number field to prove this result of his and to find his explicit formulas for L chi 1. And uh, we'll start off on the zeta function of a number field on Thursday. So if you want to have, prepare for this, as I say, all the books on number theory define these things, uh, take a look at Samuel, and I'll do a really quick review of the basic theory of number fields before we start off with the uh, Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> you know how the point goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> 